this closing talk, I'd like to speak to what response does God look for from us in return for the gift of his love that knows no boundary, limit, or breaking point. And I turn your attention to the first two verses of chapter 14 of John's Gospel. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God still and trust in me. In 1982, the movie that won the Oscar in Hollywood as the best film of the year was Chariots of Fire. The true story of two British runners, Eric Liddell and Harold Abrahams, who won gold medals in the 1924 Olympics, and they won against the odds through character, discipline, and courage. There was one scene in the movie that really grabbed me. Liddell is a truly devout Christian, a Scottish Congregationalist. He's got an authentic call to serve as a missionary in China once the games are over. But his sister Mary is afraid that if her brother wins the gold, he's going to get so caught up in the hurrah, the hoopla, the praise, the attention, and of course all the money, that he's going to forget about his call to go to China in the missions. So on the night before the race, she goes to him and she begs him. In fact, she pleads with him to drop out of the race. And he looks at her with eyes of great compassion. And in a very gentle voice, he says, but Mary, God made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. Do you understand, Mary? When I run, I feel his pleasure. The theme of everything I want to say this morning in one sentence is this. The splendor of a human heart that trusts it is loved unconditionally gives God more pleasure than Westminster Cathedral, the Sistine Chapel, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, Van Gogh's Sunflowers, the sight of 10,000 butterflies in flight, or the scent of a million orchids in bloom. Trust is our gift back to God, and he finds it so enchanting that Jesus died for love of it. Once again, trust is our gift back to God, and he finds it so enchanting that Jesus died for love of it. In 1932, the premier spiritual writer of that decade was a Frenchman who was working as a missionary in India. His name was Paul de Jaye, and he wrote these words. Trust is that rare and priceless treasure that wins us the affection of our Heavenly Father. Why is trust such a rare and priceless treasure? Because it often demands a degree of courage that borders on the heroic. When the shadow of Jesus' cross falls across our lives in the fair form of rejection, abandonment, loneliness, failure, unemployment, loss of income, depression, when the world around us is suddenly a hostile and a menacing place, when we are deaf to everything but the shriek of our own heartache, we may cry out in anguish, but how could a loving God permit that to happen? And at that moment, the seed of distrust is sown. In the more than four decades since I was first shanghaied by Jesus, in Little Chapel in the Allegheny Mountains of Western Pennsylvania, and literally the thousands and thousands of hours of prayer, meditation, silence, solitude over those years, living in monasteries, caves, desert places, I am now utterly convinced that childlike surrender and trust is the defining spirit of authentic discipleship, and I would add that the supreme need in most of our lives is an unshaken, unfailing trust in the love of God. 
when the brilliant theologian, John Kavanaugh, teaching at St. Louis University in Chicago, this is eight years ago, he was 38 years old, and he was suddenly burnt out by teaching and in a state of utter confusion as what to do with the rest of his life. So he took a three-month sabbatical. He went down to Mother Teresa's house of the dying in Calcutta. Well, the first morning there, Mother Teresa comes up to him and says, John, I'm glad you're here. What can I do for you? And he said, please pray for me. She said, I'll do that. What shall I pray for? And with all this confusion swirling around in his head, he said, please pray that I have clarity. And she said very firmly, I will not do that. Clarity is the last thing you're clinging to, and you've got to let go of it. But he said, Mother Teresa, it seems to me you've had clarity from the very beginning of your vocation. She started laughing. She said, I've never had clarity. What I've always had is trust. John, I'm going to pray that you trust God. Craving clarity, we seek to avoid the risk of trust. And we also might presume that trust is going to dispel the confusion, illuminate the darkness, vanquish the uncertainty, and redeem the times. But the cloud of witnesses in Hebrews 11 says this is not so. Our trust does not bring final clarity on this earth. earth. It does not still the chaos. It doesn't dull the pain. And it doesn't provide a crutch. When everything else is unclear, the heart of biblical trust says, Abba, into your hands, I commend my spirit. Though we often disregard the essential, imperative need for trust, in my last 42 years in ministry, I am convinced that it is the most urgent need in the lives of most of the Christians that I've met. It's the remedy for so much of our fear, our anxiety, our melancholy, our self-hatred, and our sickness. The heart converted from mistrust to trust in the irreversible forgiveness of Jesus Christ is redeemed from the corrosive power of fear. The existential dread that salvation is reserved for the proper and the pious, the nameless fear that I'm predestined to backslide, the brooding pessimism that the good news of God's wild, passionate, what Chesterton called the furious love of God is simply too good to be true. All of these things combine to weave a thin membrane of distrust that keep us in a chronic state of anxiety. What I call the second conversion. This is after you've accepted Jesus into your life as saving Lord. The second or decisive conversion from distrust to trust is the moment of sovereign deliverance from the warehouse of worry. So life-changing is this ultimate act of confidence in the acceptance of Jesus Christ that it can properly be called the hour of salvation. So often what I find notoriously missing in evangelical definitions of salvation is Jesus died on the cross, he saved my sins, I'm free, I'm going to heaven. What is notoriously missing is self-acceptance. Paul Tillich said... The best definition of faith is, faith is the courage to accept acceptance. The courage to accept acceptance. Self-acceptance is not pop psychology. It's not the power of positive thinking. It's not uh, some current fad in all these how-to books. Self-acceptance is a profound act of faith in the acceptance of Jesus Christ, of me as I am and not as I should be. And that self-acceptance bids good riddance to unhealthy guilt, shame, remorse, self-hatred. Anything less, self-rejection in any form, is a manifest sign that we have not accepted the total sufficiency of Jesus' redeeming work. Has Jesus set you free of fear of the Father and dislike of yourself. Dislike of self is an insult to Jesus because he has said courage to accept acceptance. 
at, of me as I am, with all my warts, flaws, with all my uh, sin, selfishness, dishonesty, degraded love, right now with all my uh, feeble prayer life, my shallow faith, my inconsistent discipleship, Jesus loves me and accepts me as I am and not as I should be because I'm never going to be as I should be. The words of the 15th century theologian, Angelus Silesius, who said, if God stopped thinking of me, he would cease to exist. Those words are thoroughly orthodox. Angelus is merely paraphrasing what Jesus says in John's Gospel, in, rather in Luke's Gospel, five sparrows are sold for only two pennies. And yet your heavenly Father never forgets even one of them. God even numbers the hairs you have on your head. And it wouldn't take him too long to count yours, would it? <laughs> so Jesus says, don't be afraid. You're worth more than a flock of sparrows. Now the merchant of mistrust dismisses these words as hyperbole, remains grim, sullen, fearful. The child of God accepts these words with joy and has an attack, maybe even a seizure, of the happies. <laughs> I'll never forget the witness of a friend of mine, an Episcopal priest named Tom Menifee. He's just assigned to a church in Seattle, Washington, St. Luke's. Well, the first Sunday there, he preaches at all the services, then he stands in the lobby to greet people as they come out. He notices at the last service, there's a young couple in their early 30s sitting in the last row, the last pew of the church with their one-year-old son, Andrew. And their custom is, the moment the service ends, they bolt out the door and they greet no one. Why? Because they are so ashamed of what they said, called a defective child. To this day, the husband, Robin, is the most famous cardiac surgeon in the Pacific Northwest. His wife is a pediatric surgeon, and they asked, how could God give to such brilliant, devoted, committed Christians such a defective child in the childhood Down syndrome? Well, as was their custom at the end of the service, they started to bolt out the door. Tom Menifee intercepted them. He didn't ask. He said, come into my office right now. He invited me along. We go into his office. Tom closes the door. He reaches out and he takes little Andrew in his arms and begins to rock him back and forth. Then we all saw the tears streaming down Tom's face. And then the sobbing. The low sobbing that grew louder and louder and louder and louder. We all stood there mesmerized. Finally, when his sobbing subsided, Tom said to the husband, Robin, do you have any idea of the gift that God has given to you in this child? He said, two years ago, my three-year-old daughter, Sylvia, died of Down syndrome. My wife and I have four other children. We are absolutely convinced that the greatest gift we ever received from God was little Sylvia. In her uninhibited expression of affection, she was a window into the heart of Jesus Christ. He said, did you know that three Native American tribes, the Sioux, the Iroquois, the Navajo, attributed divinity, divinity to Down's children, gave them an honor place in the tribe, and treated them as gods, because in their utter simplicity, they were a transparent window into the great spirit, in our context, into the heart of Jesus Christ. Tom handed the little boy back to his dad, and he said, Robin, you treasure this child because he is going to lead you more directly into the love of Christ than anybody you'll ever meet in your life. And the next Sunday, there's Robin and his wife, Allie, sitting up in the front row, holding up little Andrew, suggesting that they had been specially chosen by God to bear a Down's child. 
My point is this. Uncompromising trust in the love of God enables us to thank him for the spiritual darkness that envelops us, to thank him for the loss of income, for unemployment, for the nagging arthritis that is so painful. It empowers us to pray from the heart, Abba, into your hands, I commend my spirit, this whole day, morning, noon, evening, night, whatever you want of me, I want of me, falling into you, trusting you in the midst of my life. Abba, into your heart, I commend my heart, feeble, distracted, insecure, uncertain. Abba, into you, I commend myself, through Jesus, your Son, my Lord. Amen. Allow me to become personal here for a moment. The biggest obstacle in my own journey of trust has been a sense of low self-esteem, feelings of insecurity, inadequacy, and inferiority since I was a little child. My mother was an orphan, and she was in an orphanage for 10 years, never received any love as a child, never ever given any as a parent. My father, I was born during the Depression, had an eighth grade education. He went out, he couldn't find work, came home every night depressed. All he would do would speak a word of correction and administer physical discipline, take me into my bedroom, tell me to drop my pants, beat me across my back and my buttocks with his leather belt. My most vivid memory is when I was six years old, this was December 21st of 1940, four days before Christmas, it was a snowy night, my father came home without finding a job, and he said to my mother, how are the boys today? My mother turned to my brother, Rob, who was a year and three months older, and said, he is evil. He is utterly obnoxious. He is the most selfish, disobedient child in the entire world. She said, Emmett, take him down to the police station right now, tell the cops to lock him up, and leave him there. My father did. My father put... Navy peacoat over my brother, marching down to the police station. And I, here I am, six years old, crawling up at the windowsill, my nose pressed against the glass, hoping against hope that my brother's going to return. A half hour later, I see my father walking up on this snowy night by himself. And if I live to be 200 years old, I'll never be able to describe the terror, the absolute sheer terror that gripped my heart. Now I knew there was nobody there to protect me. There was nobody there for me. The next time I acted out, I was going down to jail to spend the rest of my life there. And then through the tears, I see my brother about 30 yards behind my dad making a snowball. Well, the inner panic temporarily subsided, but I was still scarred and shaken. I wiped the tears from my eyes. I climbed down from the windowsill and I assumed the macho position of little six-year-old boys don't cry, and I pretended disinterest in a traumatic event that haunted me until I was 44 years old. There's one more scene to that story, and this was years back in an hour of prayer in the morning out of nowhere, I had an image of my mother flashing across my mind. And here my mother was six years old, and she was in the orphanage in Montreal, Canada, where she was born, and I let her visit. It's a wicked, wicked, mean-spirited place. And my mother was tears rolling down her face, and she was begging God to send her a mommy and daddy who would take her out of that awful place. The prayer was not answered for seven years. But suddenly, as I looked at that image, all the anger, all the resentment that had been simmering over the years because my mother was never there for me, disappeared like last night's dream. And then my mother said to me, after I asked her forgiveness, she said, I messed up a lot when you were a kid. I didn't know how to love anybody. But she said, you turned out okay. And then my mother, who had never once held me, hugged me, embraced me, kissed me, who constantly told me I was a pest, a nuisance, basically would well, sit down in the corner, shut up and die, but leave me alone, for the first time ever, my mother kissed me, embraced me, and at that moment, the greatest enemy of trust in my life was disarmed. 
My point is this. When we wallow in shame, remorse, self-hatred, and guilt over real or imagined failings in the past, we are betraying our distrust in the love of God, that we have not accepted the acceptance of Jesus Christ, the total sufficiency of his redeeming work. Preoccupation with our past sins, our present weaknesses, our character defects, gets our emotions churning in self-destructive ways, closes us in in the mighty citadel of self, and completely preempts the presence of the compassion of God. I can speak here out of personal experience. The language of low self-esteem is a language that is harsh and demanding. It is abusive, accusing, criticizing, rejecting, fault-finding, blaming, constantly fault-finding, condemning, reproaching, scolding myself in a constant monologue of impatience with self and chastisement of self. Rather than being surprised I've ever done anything good, I'm shocked and horrified that I failed. And I'd never judge any of God's other children with the savage condemnation with which I crushed myself. And of course it's understandable with this image of self that we hide our true selves from God in prayer. We simply don't trust that he can handle all that goes on in our minds and our hearts. I mean, can Jesus handle my hateful thoughts, my cruel fantasies, my bizarre dreams? I mean, can Jesus cope with my primitive sexual urges? I'm 70 years old, and three, at least three, four times a day, I'm having lustful images, lustful desires. I mean, 30 years ago, it was 30 or 40 times a day. And here I am at 70, ordained a, a priest for uh, 42 years, and wondering how Jesus can cope with all those primitive, lustful desires. How can he cope with my exalted image of myself? Because I start believing my own press clippings of what a wonderful man I am. <laughs> can he cope with the exalted images I'm always building in Spain? I conclude that he can't. And thus I withhold from Jesus what is most in need of his healing touch. I'll never forget this. It's back in 1989, I'm invited to give a lecture at Stanford University in Palo Alto, California. Well, the lecture is at 7 o'clock at night. I'm walking, it's 6.30 now, I'm walking down a path, and a student passes me by, a 20-year-old sophomore. He looks at me and he says, hey man, you're cool. He said, I like your voluminous jeans. And I'm wearing these. Now, any other campus, they would have said, I like your baggy jeans. But this is Stanford. I like your voluminous jeans. <laughs> he says, for an old goat, you're cool, man. Really cool. To this day, I don't know what got into me. But I turn around. I am right in his face. And with mock indignation, I say, if you ain't cool... What is the point of going on? <laughs> you give me one good reason why I should go slogging through the molasses of this dark, dreary, dismal world that you ain't cool. <laughs> Do you know what it's like to be 65 years old and be uncool in a cool world? <laughs> he backs off, he says, geez, man, it ain't that bad. Then he says, why don't you go talk to the chaplain? <laughs> well, I invite him to the lecture. We both laughed. I invite him to the lecture. He comes. I walk him back to his dormitory that night, and he tells me how distant he feels from God. And these were his exact words. He said, the academic load here at Stanford is heavy. You know, I used to have a vibrant prayer life in high school, but I've gotten so busy here with studies, fraternity life, and just trying to fit in that I've grown careless in my relationship with Jesus. I really miss him. Then he turned aside. He didn't want me to see these wiping tears away from his eyes. Then he continued, I wish I could feel his presence like I used to. Used to. But life in the fast lane keeps me so distracted that sometimes I wonder if I trust in God at all. Then I get scared. But I keep doing the same stuff out of habit because I can't imagine any other alternative. I wish.
Oh, how I wish I was closer to God. Well, the next morning, a woman, a faculty member, comes to my room for counseling. And what she said was almost an identical repeat of what the student said the night before. Here's what she said. Brennan, at one point in my life, I had a faith so strong that it shaped the very fiber of my day. The fire of Christ really burned inside me. I was conscious of God's presence even in stressful situations. But since I got here to Stanford, almost imperceptibly, I stopped sitting at the fireplace. She said, the academic competition here among the faculty is worse than it is from the student, with the students. And then with a sigh, she sank back in her chair, and I saw tears rolling down her cheeks. Then she continued, I came to your lecture last night in the love of God, and I cried for the entire hour. My life is so empty. I see so much pain and suffering on and off campus. I feel a deep resistance that God is really loving. I think I still have faith, but I can't feel it. I've lost any sense of God's presence. I'm like Mary Magdalene in the garden crying out, where is my beloved gone? I miss God so much right now that I feel frantic. I long for the relationship that I used to have. And here's what I ask each one of you to do. For the next 60 seconds, imagine that you are the God revealed by and in Jesus Christ, that you are the risen Jesus yourself, and you're looking at these two people, the student and the faculty member. The young man is sad because he misses you. He's downcast that he's not closer to you. He's grieving that he's gotten so busy as to neglect you. And he's close to panic that he doesn't trust in your love anymore. <clears throat> the woman is in tears because she can't feel your presence as she once did. Her heartache lies in experiencing your absence rather than your presence. She too has been ambushed by, by academia. She fears that her faith is fading that she's lost you forever. Now you're the risen Jesus looking at these two people. What are your feelings toward them? Do you think they have a relationship with you? Do you think that they love you? Is your heart overflowing with compassion because they feel exile from you? Do you see their entire lives right now as a cry of longing, a prayer of heartfelt longing, longing for you alone? And the moment they call your name, when you sweep them up in your arms and embrace them. Well, take your own feelings, multiply them exponentially into infinity, and you've got a vague hint of the love of God for you in Christ Jesus. With a strong affirmation of your goodness, and a gentle understanding of your weakness, God is forever loving you, and there is nothing you can do to increase his love for you, and nothing you can do to diminish it. Maybe in the past few months you've gotten waylaid in your walk with Jesus by busyness, depression, family problems, unemployment, or something worse. Maybe you feel that God has abandoned you. If you're wandered off the path, you will never believe that God abandoned you. In fact, you will never flinch, hesitate, or worry about being welcome in the arms of Jesus Christ. And no matter where you are in the journey, you maintain a quiet confidence that your trust in God gives him immense pleasure. Of course, if you picture God as touchy, unapproachable, easily annoyed, if you Im imagine God as being haughty, indifferent, or angry, if you invest him with unlovable qualities, then you'll dismiss the way of trust as a soft, easy path for wimps and wusses. It'll be your skepticism, your cynicism, your lack of belief in the wild, passionate, furious, pursuing, furious love of God that will remove Jesus in our midst into the great beyond 
and you'll assume he's totally disengaged from the joys and struggles of your life. When I was a child, our family was very poor, so we never gave presents at Christmas, and never gave presents at birthday. We made things for one another. The one great source of feminine love in my life was my paternal grandmother. I look back now and see that as my first experience of unconditional love. My grandmother would take me to the St. Patrick's Day Parade, and because I was so short, she'd hoist me up on her shoulders for well over an hour to watch all the floats that pass by. Then they'd go, she'd buy me ice cream. She loved me in a way that simply defies description. Well, on my 12th birthday in 1946, my grandmother left a little card. It was a piece of cardboard with handwriting on it in her own hand. And since then, I've had that card plasticized. I've had it laminated. I've had it hugely uh, blown up. And now I have it in a frame on my uh, wall of my office back in New Orleans. And all the words on the card say was, never was a mother so blind to the faults of her child as the Lord Jesus is toward ours. So never be discouraged by your faults. Once again, never was a mother so blind to the faults of her child as the Lord Jesus is toward ours. So never be discouraged by your faults. Would you gently close your eyes and join me in prayer? Lord Jesus, over and over and again in the Gospels, you've taught us that fear is the enemy of trust. You said to your disciples, do not live in fear, little flock. It has pleased my Father to give you the kingdom. Why? Not because you're terrific, not because you're saying the right things or doing the right things or becoming the right things. You inherit the kingdom because, in that lovely Greek word, eudokia, my Father in his sheer good pleasure wants to give you the kingdom. To the sinking Peter in the Sea of Galilee, you said, don't be afraid, Peter, it's me. When you walked into the home of Jairus and the whole family, all the relatives thought the child was dead and you said the child is not dead, it's alive, they began to mock you and you said to them, fear is useless, what is needed is trust. Jesus, I humbly ask you that you walk down the aisles of this church in your great compassion lay your healing hand upon each one of us, free us of fear Free us of shame about our past, of fear about the present, of anxiety about the future. Anoint us with that unwavering, unflagging, unblinking, invincible trust in your love. And teach each person here, as you've taught me, trust is our gift back to God. And you, Lord Jesus, have found it so enchanting that you died for love of it.